For some people, the practice of meditation involves two very different kinds of activities. One is getting the mind to be still, and the other is giving rise to insight. And these are very sharply divided. But to get the mind still, you simply just force it to stay with one thing and don't allow it to think at all. Then when it's rested, then you're allowed to do some thinking. Give it a specific topic to deal with, like the 32 parts of the body, the problem of pain, whatever happens to come up in the mind as a specific problem. And you analyze it and deal with it, and you find that your analysis starts to get fuzzy or blunt. It's thinking of it as a inside as a sharp knife. You cut it and cut things and cut things and cut things, and finally find that you can't cut through things anymore. That's when you've got to get the moment to stop, be still again. And the stilling is what sharpens the blade so that it's ready to come out and do some more cutting. For other people, though, the development of an insight and serenity or tranquility is something that happens together. It's specifically true of the way the Buddha teaches breath meditation. Because as he defines tranquility, it's a matter of getting the mind to settle down. And insight is a matter of learning to see things in terms of fabrication, how they get put together, what processes are, and how to develop a sense of dispassion toward them. And it always stands to reason that as you develop a sense of dispassion, the mind is going to get more still. And the more still you are, the more clearly you'll see things in these terms, if you're looking for them in these terms. That's what breath meditation is all about. In the different tetrads, the first tetrad corresponds to the body, the second one corresponds to feelings, the third corresponds to mind or intent. The word jitta here can also mean intent. And then finally the dharmas, or mental qualities, is the fourth. In each case, you're sensitizing yourself to some aspect of fabrication that's going on. In the first one, it's the fabrication in the breath itself. You sensitize yourself to when the breath is short, when it's relatively long. And the text only says that much, but what you're actually doing is learning how to notice how short breathing affects the body, how long breathing affects the body. On the other hand, how the state of the body affects the way you breathe. Then the Buddha has you get sensitive to the entire body. And then he says, calm bodily fabrication. That's the fourth step. What this means is it calms the effect of the breath on the body. The breath calms down. The intentional element of the breath calms down as well. And this can involve a lot of things. It can actually get to the point where the breath stops. But you also begin to gain some insight as you're doing this to how much intentional element there is in the breathing. I've had a lot of people who've practiced mindfulness methods where they were told simply to let the breath do its own thing. And then they come to the John Lee method where he actually tells them to adjust the breath, play with the breath, work to get it comfortable. And at first they resist, but after a while, they've, after they've been doing this, they begin to become more and more sensitive to the element of intention of the breathing, and they begin to realize that they were working with the breath already. It was just that they denied the fact. Or they've been taught to overlook the extent to which they were already fabricating the breath. So it's an important part of the meditation is to sensitize yourself to how much you are shaping things, so that then you can actually let that process of shaping things calm down. 
to a level you might not have imagined before, where all the breath energies in the body seem to connect up and you, you're getting enough oxygen through the pores of your skin, so you don't need to do any in and out breathing. And right there you've gained some insight into the process of fabrication at the same time that the mind is beginning to calm down. This is how tranquility and insight develop together, using the body as your frame of reference. You learn many of the same lessons in terms of feelings in the second tetrad. But it starts out by telling you to be sensitive to rapture, sensitive to pleasure. And that can be based on lots of different things. The sense of well-being that comes from developing virtue, developing generosity. The sense of confidence that arises from contemplating the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, the qualities they had, or recollecting on your own past virtues, your own past acts of generosity. In the, they say the qualities of the devas that you've been de developing, which include generosity and restraint. When you think about that, it gives you a sense of confidence that you're not just a weight on the world. And you're also, you're also worthy of doing this practice. Sometimes those thoughts can give rise to a sense of pleasure, which then can become the basis of concentration. Once you allow yourself to be sensitive to the pleasure, <coughs> excuse me, sensitive to the pleasure of the rapture, then the Buddha tells you to be sensitive to the effect that these are having on the mind, not only the feelings but also the perceptions that go along with them. These shape the mind. These are mental fabrications. And as you notice that, then you allow them to calm down. For instance, if the rapture feels too, too intense, you allow it to calm down. You tune into an area of your awareness that's more refined than the rapture. Or when the pleasure seems superfluous, something you want to settle in, just be very, very still. You get the mind to a state of equanimity. What you're doing is allowing the the mental fabrication of feeling to calm down. Then there are the perceptions that you have. And this can actually take you deeper into the formless jhanas. As you see that holding on to the perception of the shape of the body is a burden on the mind. You can drop that. You're left with space. The space inside the body, the space outside the body, and it all connects. has no boundary. And then you're just aware of that awareness. It changes your perception. The, the mental fabrication of perception gets more and more refined. So it's just knowing, knowing, knowing. And even the oneness of that knowing begins to seem burdensome. So you drop that and you're just left with that. The dimension of nothingness. You can pursue this all the way up through the, the formless jhanas. As you allow mental fabrication to calm down. So what you're doing, you're developing tranquility and insight at the same time. The mind gets more still, and you're beginning to gain more and more insight into this process of fabrication. The same principle applies to the, the third tetrad when you're aware of the mind. Again, it starts out by telling you to be sensitive to that aspect of your awareness. And your mind can also mean intent, the intent that you have to stay with the breath. You're clear on that. You're clear on the state of your mind, the state of your awareness. And then you see what it needs. Does it need to be gladdened? Does it need more energy? Or do you think about things that give it gladness? 
like the recollections. Or by adjusting the breath. Or by adjusting your perceptions of the breath. The perceptions of what you're focusing on. Then you allow the mind to get more and more steady. Okay, what perceptions allow it to get more steady? Perception of the breath as a whole body process gets it more steady. Your perception that you're not separate from the breath, that you're not on one part of the body or habit inhabiting one part of the body and watching the breath in some other part of the body, but you're actually one with the breath. You're surrounded by the breath. That perception has <laughs> to steady the mind even further. So you're seeing that as you glad the mind, steady the mind, and as the Buddha says, releasing the mind, and this can mean anything from you know, releasing it from thoughts of sensuality and all the other hindrances that eat away at your meditation. You release it from that, and then you find yourself in the different levels of jhana, and you begin to release yourself from the coarser levels to the more refined ones. Or you can release yourself from the activity of intending concentration. And get ultimate release. So the mind gets more and more still. At the same time, you're beginning to see this process of fabrication, how much intention shapes your awareness, and how you can change your intentions and have it create different levels of gladness, steadiness, and release in your awareness. So here again, tranquility and insight go together. The same applies to the fourth foundation. You start out being aware of impermanence or inconstancy. In the early stages of the meditation, this means focusing on the inconstancy of anything that would pull you away from your concentration, so that you can develop a sense of dispassion for whatever it is, all the stories we bring with us, all the concerns we bring with us that tend to pop up as we begin to get the mind to settle down. You have a whole hour, and the part of the mind says, well, let's think about this. You suddenly find yourself planning next month or regurgitating events of last month or whatever. And you've got to realize you know, those things are impermanent, stressful, not self. There's really no meat there for you. There's no nourishment. As John Lee says, it's like a dog chewing on a bone. There's nothing left on the bone, so all it has is the taste of its own saliva. Or it says it's like licking the bottom of yesterday's soup pot when there's no soup left. That's thinking about the past. Or licking tomorrow's soup pot when there's no soup in it yet. That's thinking about the future. There's no nourishment there. It comes and it goes, all these thoughts. So as you learn to see their impermanence, it develops a sense of dispassion, and because you're feeling dispassionate for them, you're no longer involved in their creation, and they stop. It's important to understand that relationship between dispassion and cessation. Dispassion means being dispassionate toward the activities that you're doing, the things that you're creating. Once you feel dispassion, you don't feel the need to create them anymore, and they stop. If your insight goes deep enough, you can actually end that particular activity, that particular defilement. As the Buddha says, you relinquish it, you give it back. Whatever you lay claim to, you just give it back. And John Lee's term is spitting it out. It's something you've taken into your mouth, you realize you don't want it anymore, you spit it back out. As I said at the beginning, this, this applies to all the topics that would pull you away from your concentration. As your concentration begins to develop and you get more and more sensitive, it starts applying to the concentration itself. As you see the inconstancy of one level of concentration, and it lets you let go of whatever inconstancy you can detect in it, and that takes you to a deeper level and a deeper level. And finally, you can abandon your attachment to concentration altogether. 
That's when the dispassion is total, the cessation is total, and the relinquishment is total. You even give up the whole path. So in following the steps of breath meditation, you're actually developing concentration by developing tranquility and insight at the same time. You're getting the mind to settle down at the same time you're learning how to look at fabrications and regard fabrications in a way that gives rise to dispassion. That's the Buddha said. To gain good, strong concentration, to attain the jhanas, he says, develop tranquility, develop insight. Once the concentration has gotten solid, okay, if you want to gain total release, again, use the concentration, use the jhana as a basis for deeper tranquility and deeper insight. In this way they all go together. And as for the question of how you balance them, as John Lee says when you're working with the breath, you find that you'll sometimes be stressing the tranquility side more, sometimes the insight side more, but there's always some insight in your meditation, in your concentration. There's always some tranquility in your insight. It's just a question of which side you're going to stress more at any one particular time, which the mind seems to need more. And that involves learning how to read your mind, that third tetrad. Does it need more gladdening? Does it need more release? Does it need more steadying? But as you get more and more sensitive in how you read your mind, read the processes of fabrication, either in terms of the body or the feelings, mind, or just mental qualities. Learning how to develop that balance, that's an important part of insight as well. When you need to let go of certain things and which things you need to hang on to in the meantime. You don't want to be the sort of person who has a few moments of concentration and lets them go and says, okay, well, I've, been, I've gotten beyond concentration now. That goes nowhere. It short circuits the whole path. You use fabrication to get to the end of fabrication. That's an important element of insight right there. And as your skill develops in developing both tranquility and insight, the whole path comes together. Even for people whom, for whom insight practice and tranquility practice are two radically separate things, they find that as the path begins to reach fruition, everything comes together. Ajahn Mahabhava talks about at that point it's hard to draw a line between insight practice and tranquility practice. They both reach balance. So you can't determine ahead of time which sort of person you're going to be, whether it's going to be two radically separate practices or more integrated practice from the very beginning. But the integration is where we're all headed. And it's a matter of learning how to read your own mind to figure out how the balance is going to be developed. Some things start out in a balanced state, other things swing widely from one side to the other before the balance finally settles down to its balance point. But the balance point is where it's headed. <laughs>